Raising the Bets is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Raising the Bets, where a Catholic couple raising five kids outside of Boston join us as we share the joys and challenges of marriage, homeschool, and our adventures near and far as we make sense of the world and experience the best parts of our culture. I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. And as you can hear, we're still <laughs> not g- gorilla podcasting, as they might say, where we're, we're not in a studio, the sound isn't isn't as good, uh, but uh, hopefully it's endurable and you will uh, enjoy it. So it's been yet another couple of weeks since our last podcast. I feel like I'm at confession. Bless me, Father Fryson. It has been two weeks since my last, my last podcast. Uh-huh. Uh, but uh, we're catching up. We're we're trying to. We're you know things are crazy and it's hard to keep up with things. But uh, yeah, very so, crazy. So we get a lot to talk about, and I want to get right to it. Okay. And I want to start with feedback from some listeners that we've gotten some nice feedback. The first was a comment from Jennifer on the SQPN YouTube channel. Uh, you can listen to our podcast on YouTube. It's, they're not videos there, but they're it's right. just audio posted to YouTube. So people people like to do that. I, I it never occurred to me until someone said, "Hey, can you put them on YouTube too?" So we do that. Anyway, uh, Jennifer writes, "Oh my goodness, Dom and Melanie, how horrible! I love that Dom is keeping his sense of humor as best as possible. The details, which may be boring, are very important because it helps others recognize issues." Unfortunately, your situation with the insurance company isn't unusual. I've proofread enough court reporter transcripts to know how common it is that insurance companies have all these exclusions in their policies. We will add the Bettinelli family to our daily rosary. Thank you very much for the prayers. Yes, the prayers most appreciated. They're the most important aspect of all of this for us, and we do really appreciate that. Um, It has been a great blessing to receive the prayers of so many people, and we've it felt it. We've experienced it, and that's what, that's how we're keeping our sense of humor. The Holy Spirit has right. been blessing us, so most definitely. So, Jennifer, thank you so much for your email. Um, so far, knock on wood, uh, the insurance company hasn't been the worst part of this. So far, I mean, yes, they're not paying for the pl- the plumbing repairs. But that's kind of getting taken care of through the generosity of folks who have donated to our GoFundMe. Right. Um, and they've not pushed back too much when we've asked for, like, extensions on staying in this house. We'll get to that in a bit. And some other things like that. So it, has, it hasn't been horrible yet, <laughs> which is a low bar. But, uh, yeah. So thank you, Jennifer. Uh, and then we got another email from Lizzie. and. Um, it was a long email, a wonderful email. Talk- really, really good. Really good. And talking a lot about like how SQPN has been a blessing in her life and helped her with postpartum depression and all the various shows and all these other things. It's, it's really nice. Uh, but I did want to mention some of the things she brought up specific to our show. Uh, so first, she mentions ice cream in Massachusetts. And she says, if you're ever in Central Mass, you have to go to Rhoda Spring Farms, which I looked it up. It's uh, it's in Clinton, I think it is, okay. or near Clinton, uh, which is near Worcester. Amazing ice cream, and they have the animals out, which is extra fun. Listen, I know what you're thinking. Something good exists west of Route 495? <laughs> but yes, I promise you that it is worth it to venture out into the non-Boston part of the state for this ice cream. So that's the first part. Uh, by coincidence, we've been talking about actually... Going to Western Massachusetts. Yeah, visiting. There's lots of awesome places out there in Western Mass. Uh, we would we'd been talking for a while. In fact, before yeah. COVID, we were talking about camping. Yeah, somewhere out near New York, actually, like way out Stockbridge with the Norman Rockwell Museum. There's uh the Pioneer Valley and the the Mohawk Trail. I think they call it. There's a highway, scenic highway. Anyway. Uh, so then she says, Melanie, I know you tried Barbara Pym, but you chose the wrong book to start with. Restart with Excellent Women to give her a real chance. Excellent. I will try that. Excellent Women. Yes. <laughs> which was the... So you would... I read um, uh, Quartet in Autumn, which was 
Oh, and, well, that was about the four the four people yeah, who yeah. worked together. And, and it was it was her her last book, I think. And as, as I recall, it was actually put posthumously published. So it was sort of the definitely not polished, not 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 not, not polished, just not. It, it was a departure from her normal. Okay. So not the one to start with, like as she's saying. Okay, I get that. Uh, then she says, Dom, random question, but if, I, if I've watched the whole series of The Expanse on Prime, will I still appreciate the books? Are they different enough and good enough to enjoy while knowing what's going to happen? So I experienced the, so The Expanse is the Amazon Prime series, which is right. fantastic sci-fi, but it's also was originally a set of novels, a series of novels uh, set in the near future. And it's, it's hard sci-fi. Right. It's really good. And so it's hard for me to say because I experienced it in the opposite order. I read the books before the series came out, before the you know, the TV series. Uh, but there's a lot more, as always, in the books than there is on TV. And actually, I think having seen the show, it might help. Uh, there were a couple books where in the midst of it, I was kind of a little confused, like, I'm not sure exactly what's going on and who these people are. And what, but now that I've seen the show, it makes a lot more sense. It, the visual and right. simplification that happens through a, through a show means that the plot is clearer. The thread is a lot easier to follow. So, in fact, you may actually be better the, having watched it first and then reading it. So, uh, fantastic books. I really I highly recommend them. One of these days, I'll get around to it. One of these days? I know we say that to each other about lots of things that we yeah. each read. So thank you both for your for the feedback. We really do appreciate it. All right, let's talk about what's been going on since the last time we talked. We're, we're still in Plymouth. Yeah. Uh, we originally were here till November 8th, and that's the day we're recording it. This? Was it 8th? Really? Wow. Actually, the 7th. We were leaving on, on a Sunday. Uh, we've had to extend our stay by at least two weeks. We say at least. At least. I'm not, I'm not holding none, my breath. None of us wants to leave. It wants to stay longer than that, frankly. Uh, not that this has been terrible at all. This, it's actually been a really nice place, but we're all pretty much ready to get back into our home. Um, yeah, then the reason we got, we got extended is because the plumbers couldn't start until today which they didn't they called in sick and they'll be there tomorrow we they, hope they better be there tomorrow or <laughs> we're gonna have a very stern call with somebody um but being here at at, at, the, at this house a third of a mile from the beach which, which you can see from the windows of the living room um pretty awesome yeah the the, the beach aspects have been nice um the kids have certainly enjoyed it I mean, a lot more than if we were stuck in a hotel room with nothing interesting to do or right. nowhere to go. As we said, that was originally what the insurance company wanted to do was put us in a couple of hotel rooms with barely adequate cook, like inadequate cooking facilities, not even barely adequate, inadequate. Um, but the ability to just up and walk down to the ocean every day. Which we've been trying to do. I, yeah, we've we've had a few days when we haven't made it down, but sometimes there's been a few rainy days. We'll get to that in a second, but um, yeah, as I said to the kids, they one one of the times we were down there is, you got we've got to spend two months by the beach. Like that is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Like that's you, you don't get to do that usually. Right, I've never right. I mean, unless you uh, have the means to buy a house at the beach. You know, the ability to just kind of up and stay and, you know, in the fall, uh, you know, granted, it's not the best season for swimming, but. No, we have not been doing swimming. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let me tell you. But long walks on the beach wearing boots is not bad. And the, and every day, I mean, that's one of the things that I've always known about the ocean. I've always lived near the ocean, within a few miles of the ocean. Um, and one thing that's that you know about the ocean is, is it's constantly changing. Every day is different. Yeah. Um, we've, we've discovered lots of really cool things like, well, okay. So it's a little bit <laughs> well, cool. Maybe may very, your definition of cool may be different from ours. Okay. So. Keep, keeping in mind that we're homeschoolers and like <laughs> nature study and science are really our thing. Um, 
But we've been discussing how finding dead animals is actually kind of a cool opportunity because these animals, you can, can't get close to them when they're alive. They run away from you. Right. Um, and when, when you find them dead, you can get really up close and see details that you'd never have seen before. So we found some, like, things like dead mice and a dead woodpecker. But then this week we hit the bonanza and we <laughs> jackpot <laughs> jackpot. Um, we so we found a dead seal on the beach. Yes, like um, a like a real like seal, a harbor seal, um, which had been washed up on the beach. And I mean, it's sad, but things yeah. die, and the, the circle of life. Yes, and it's been fascinating to to see yes. up close and personal. <laughs> Uh, and then not too close. Not too close. <laughs> it doesn't. I mean, it's not like super gross, smelly. It's not yeah. like that stage yet. But it's something's been eating it. Yeah. yeah. Let's um, just say that. And then we found um, a bird, a large bird, large right on the um, on the beach, walkway to the beach, the beach. access. Yeah. And uh, we took some photos, and a friend of mine who teaches uh, ornithology helped us to identify it as a gannet, which is one of those seabirds that don't really come to shore. They're they're offshore birds. Like right. you might be able to see them with a really, really good pair of binoculars on a really clear day sort of birds. Yeah. Um again. Probably probably died in the storm we're gonna talk about in a bit. Yes. Uh but yeah. But kind of cool. Fascinating. Yeah. I know we're weird. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but the kids were very excited when we we made the identification, and my friend uh, shared a picture of the skull. But was they were just like, "Wow, yeah, that beak is exactly the same as the one that we saw." Uh, so it's kind of fun, hands hands on. Well, not hands on. No, it's not literally we're not, hands on. We're not touching him. Close. Uh, but but science. Yeah. From a different perspective, and the kids have all got very handy at you know what what tide is it. Is it high tide, low tide? Is the tide ebbing? Is it, uh, yeah. is it um, coming in? Right, rising. Eb, eb, Thank you. Flood. And, yeah. and so we've been noticing, like, and we've we've learned a lot about erosion and yeah. um, how the beach changes over time due to weather. And then there's like a nearby uh, salt marsh and or in a, in a freshwater like boggy pond right with all kinds of birds in it I oh mean, tonight we saw we saw flights and flights and flights of ducks coming mm -hmm. in to land on the marsh as we were walking home from the beach after sunset which was really cool so i mean as you can probably guess from from the way we're talking it means it has been nothing it has been far from a terrible experience <laughs> Right. The the house part has been an ordeal. But right. The and I've actual... been dealing I've been dealing mostly with most of that. Right. But but the actual like day to day living stuff has been right. kind of nice. The foods the food part is still a pain because again, we're not in our own kitchen and so we don't have access to all our usual things and so trying to figure out what to make and not making the same three dishes every day, every day week, you know what I mean? It, that's been hard. That's been a hard thing dealing with that. Uh, that's why you haven't heard us talking about lots of different re new recipes we're trying because yeah, we're not. We are not trying new recipes. This is right. it, this is a old standby yeah. season, not new recipes. Pastas and soups and grilling when we can and that sort of thing. They have a they have a propane grill here, so it's okay. It's not as good as a charcoal. I'm a charcoal snob. Um, yes, you are. I am. Uh, but uh, yeah. So. I mentioned the storm. We had we had one of those like it was a well, it was a nor'easter that was would have been a hurricane in any other if it had had the proper rotation to it. It had it were there were hurricane force winds. Right. It it was a record breaker storm. Yes, uh, bomba genesis that they talk about because it had rapidly falling pressures over a short period of time causing big winds. I mean, there were 75 mile an hour gusts, which is hurricane force. And which when you're Little. less than a mile away from the beach, <laughs> yes, is quite an experience. So the town of Plymouth that we're in now 
was one of the worst hit towns. And there were a lot. Of, I was astounded at how many trees were down. So many trees. So the, the storm hit overnight from a Tuesday night to a Wednesday, right? Yeah. It, it, it got, started Tuesday afternoon. Right. It, and all day Tuesday, we were expecting rain. And we kept like saying, when's the rain going to start? And we, it, would, it was gusting. It was windy. It was a little it, bit windy. And there was like little bits of rain. But we kept going. We we're like, oh, the sun's come out. Let's go down to the beach before the rain hits while it's while it's clear. And we did that like two different times during the day. Yeah. And it was not bad. And then I think about sunset, the wind started to really pick up and then it hit its peak at about four o- o'clock in the morning. Overnight. And that's when we lost power at, yeah. at 4 a.m. At 4 a.m. I was having nightmares about tornadoes. <laughs> the house was shaking. Yes. It- and... The wind was just howling, and you could hear the pounding of the surf, and it was it was wild. It was pushing uh, rain under the front door, so the floor was getting wet. Right. There was a the window air conditioners were still in the in the windows. The owner hadn't taken them out, and in the girls' room there was a window air conditioner facing the direction of the wind, and so it was pushing wind around it. We had to pack towels and other stuff around it to block the wind, and it was still howling through there pretty good. Yeah. Um, and Those towels got soaked. Yeah. It, it, and so power went out at 4 o'clock in the morning, which we know because we have we have a fan blowing when we sleep. We like to sleep with a fan. And so the fan went out. and It woke me up. And woke us up. So when when we got up, we didn't have any... So no fridge, no stove, no... And we weren't really equipped for it. We didn't have any emergency supplies here. Right. At, like home, that. at home, we would have had some right. preparedness. So I decided to head back to our house to get emergency supplies, lanterns, and any food that we could cook, at the camp stove, uh, that sort of stuff, and batteries. And so I took Lucy with me uh, just so I wasn't by myself. And I had to drive through so many de- detoured streets because there were so many trees down across roads, trees down on the highways. I went from, I didn't hit, see any place with power between, our, our house is 45 minutes away from where we're staying. I didn't see any power until we were almost at our house. Like, it was like a half a million homes without power in eastern Massachusetts. And like our like our neighbor was the first, which is so ironic because... Our house, it, we lost power briefly. I, I know because the computer complained to me, the my, my computer stuff at home. But our house is always, always loses power, <laughs> even in the stiff breeze. And I bought a generator for that house, you know, for our home, which was sitting in the shed. Like, I didn't have it here. And then, so I got there, uh, gathered up the things, uh, went we actually went over to stop a shop over in Braintree, which had power because Braintree has its own utility company and therefore never loses power. And we got a bunch of stuff, came back, and we were we were hearing that it could be days to get power back. You know, it was Wednesday, so Friday, Saturday, even. Right. And there were people who didn't get their power back until Friday, Saturday. But we ended up getting it back Wednesday night, right? Like at ten. Wednesday night, it's like 10, 1030. Which was surprising to me because, again, it was pretty pretty bad out there. The, with the, the, local, the, trees library, down. the local library actually didn't get power back until Monday, they said. No, right. they were closed on Monday because they didn't get power back until Tuesday. Right. And dry, just driving around, you can still see where all the trees are down and the tree services are still really busy. So uh, pretty wild. It was a pretty wild yeah. couple of days. This house lost some shingles too. The, the roofers were here this morning to yeah. repair it. Yeah. The windows were all like dirty from being spattered by leaves and dirt and stuff. And it just, it, just, it was an interesting experience being by the shore in what was essentially a, a hurricane because we it faces north. So a nor'easter was hitting this house like directly. All right, so so that was the storm. Then the kids all started getting sick, uh, which was worrisome because we were we were afraid it would be COVID. Um, it turned out to have been colds, and you and I, you neither you or I ever got sick. We neither got sick. I, I had one day where I felt really nauseous. I don't know whether it was the cold or 
stomach bug or something I ate. I don't know. But I just woke up one day and I felt really nauseous all day uh, and then was fine after that. But you you took one of them, the, the first one to get sick, to get a COVID test, which we eventually, eventually came back. It took them forever to give us the results. Came back. It was negative. So that's fine. So it, was, it turns out it was probably just a cold for all of them. It, 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 the symptoms seemed a lot more cold-like, but I yeah. know that some people whose kids have actually had COVID said that they just seem like a cold. So right. Um. Yeah, that was so. That was exciting. Um, <laughs> exciting is the word. I mean, they were all hacking and coughing and sneezing and blah blah blah. blah. They were all in miserable for for days. They're all pretty much better now. I mean, there's still some some lingering coughs. Lingering. I mean, it's just it, it, that sort of stuff sticks around. But. Because they were all sick, we couldn't go to church on Sunday, which was um, Halloween. And we were already concerned about that we didn't have access to their usual dress-up stuff. So how were they going to trick-or-treat and where were they going to trick-or-treat? And we ended up just not trick-or-treating, which I feel bad about. Yeah. I, I My original plan had been to, to go to the thrift store or something and try to throw something together on Friday or Saturday. But on Friday... With a bunch and of Saturday, sick kids. they were all really sick, and I just couldn't imagine them actually going trick or treating. So I just, I didn't. Right. I, f- I mean, I think the one who was most disappointed was Lucy because she's the youngest. And actually, I was going to say the most disappointed was Bella. She was really disappointed. I think. Well, I think Bella knows that her, her, her window of opportunity for trick or treating is closing. She she was like, in the bargaining stage with me on on Sunday afternoon, like. Well, what if I just did this? I could throw something together. I could do this. I, I'm fine. I could do this. And I'm like, okay, but you. But what about but, the rest? No, but what about everyone else? If you if you come up with cost five costumes, one costume for everyone, I'll think about it. <laughs> what they eventually we ended up going out and buying a bunch of Halloween candy. And what they eventually ended up doing was Sophie and Bella pretended to be homeowners, and the others pretended to trick or treat to the different rooms of the house several times each as different trick-or-treaters and and bella and sophie did the ooing and awing over the pretend costumes that they weren't wearing <laughs> so it was, they they all had seemed to have fun and they yeah. they got big buckets full of candy which then they prompted to you know gorge them so they, they complained a bit because the variety wasn't as good uh as if they'd actually gone door to door. right but, no no uh bags of uh, barbecue potato chips and <laughs> other weird <laughs> weird Halloween candies. The ver- yes, there is we our neighborhood has an interesting variety of Well, I mean candies. one of the fun things about Halloween is getting to try the candies that you would never buy. Right. And just seeing what is out there, what people are giving out. Right. What are we gonna get at this next place? Yeah, so they they did miss the trying out new candies. Um I did try to get at least everybody got it a little bit of their favorites so that nobody was nobody was unhappy with that totally, completely unhappy and since halloween's my birthday we ended up the tradition is that we get chinese food on my birthday and there was actually a chinese restaurant up the street which we got food from which was pretty good it's all right yeah yeah good. it was actually less expensive than the places we usually get it from so that was nice um yeah it was that was pretty good uh, they didn't have everything i would want necessarily but i was happy with it um, and then, so that was Halloween and my birthday. And then, uh, you and I have both got our booster shots separately for COVID shots, vaccine shots that, that happened. Um, we had to go to the, I had to go to the CVS. You ended up going to stop and stop at the supermarket pharmacy. That's just a pain in the neck. And, uh, well, I, I scheduled one for CVS and they, they canceled it for no apparent reason. Yeah. They just called and canceled. Or they texted and canceled. Texted, right. They ghosted you. They so, totally ghosted me. I was, <laughs> I was sad. Which is why I was like, fine, I'll go to the grocery store instead, which was actually not an unpleasant experience. It was probably better than going to CVS. When I went to CVS, it was kind of... Yeah, uh, your, your, your experience did not fill me with confidence. It was kind of a mess because they... The, the the woman giving out the booster shots was doing them in the wrong order. There were people there whose appointments at, were after mine. Who were getting their shots? There was a guy who'd been sitting there forever who hadn't gotten his shot. Like he should have been way before everybody else. It was just yeah, it was kind of a mess. 
So, but we got our shots, which is good. Um, so the house, the progress. Yeah. So um, the we finally, like I said, we finally have the plumbers. They they were supposed to be there today. They'll be there tomorrow. It should take a few days. The contractor has been hard at work. He has assured us that we will be able to move back in by the 18th or 19th or 20th. That he, he had given us that window. He'll have, he'll sleep there overnight working if he has to, he said. Um, and, you know, he's been there on the weekends. He was there Saturday and he was even there Sunday. I wouldn't I wouldn't have told him to come on Sunday, but he, he came on Sunday uh, to, to do it. Um, fixing the walls. We've picked out like the bathroom has been totally stripped to the studs. Uh, ripped up, including jackhammered on the floor to get at the the drain that needs to be replaced. Um, we're getting a new tub, new vanity, uh, everything's painted, a new medicine cabinet even. Um, so new floors, new walls, new paint. We have to buy new furniture if there's any furniture around for the you know we need to get a new bed for Lucy, and the boys are getting a new bunk beds which someone has offered bunk beds from their the, from their kids who are grown so that's gonna be good but we'll probably need to get some new mattresses uh, an ikea shopping trip is in our future yeah not to mention that both the couch and the recliner are old, were already old and falling apart and, and now they're probably old and falling apart and, and covered smelly. in and covered in dust and mold and whatever other yeah, Gross. so I'm I'm thinking that they're probably not going to be something well, we want to even keep around. Well, the question is 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 if is replacement couch and recliner in stock anywhere? Oh, I know. They're they're that's the question. So. But we may end up sitting on the floor because if they're really covered in mold and dirt, dirt throw an then... old sheet over it and sit on it. But yeah, but okay. I know we'll we'll figure it out. We'll figure something out. We'll get we'll get the um, patio furniture and. <laughs> We live like college students. <laughs> Driving around the neighborhoods. Hey, there's someone's got an old couch sitting in front of their house. Oh, and our friend Zena has offered her couch too, remember? So that's, that's true. So that that's 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 that one. Yeah. So that that actually may take care of that. Uh, so that's where things stand. Hopefully we'll be able to move. But you haven't seen the house as it's uh recently. You've yeah. A couple of weeks ago, we went. We did some yard work. Actually, a few weeks ago, you had to plant some bulbs that you'd gotten. Yeah, I I ordered. Um, did we mention this on the last? No, no. Honest. We I think we did. We did. Oh. But but that's the last time you saw the house. Yeah. So you'll have a nice surprise. Hopefully, a good one when you see it next. All right. So that's what's been happening. Let's. Uh, like I said, we food is not something we're going to bother talking about because there's nothing nothing all that interesting. But let's talk about what we've been reading and watching because uh, we've been doing a lot of that. And I've got like a month and a half, two months worth of books okay. to talk about. All right. So you go second. I'll go first. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be quicker. <laughs> okay. I finished, I read a book called One Bullet Away, The Making of a Marine Officer by Nathaniel Fick. I'm not sure what where I got the recommendation to read it, but it's been on my to-read list for ages. And what he was a Marine who was commissioned, I almost said ordained, commissioned just before 9-11. And his first deployment was to the Middle East on a ship. And when 9-11 happened, they were the first Marine unit into Afghanistan Okay. Uh, to support the Special Forces, long, even before it, there was like a, 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 an actual invasion. And so they, he talks, writes about that. And then he, when, he, when they came back, he ended up becoming a recon Marine and then was among the first to go into Iraq. And he's so rec recounting that experience as, as well. And it was very interesting to read about his experiences, partly because my nephew is now a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. And so he's having similar experiences as a, as a young officer, but also just to, to get that ground level view, that very in, that first person viewpoint on what it was like, what, you know, what he experienced. Um, yeah, it was very. It was a very interesting story, and uh, well worth a read if you're at all interested in the history surrounding these events. I mean, it's now history, twenty years ago. Um, it's kind of sad because I'm reading this, and he's talking about Afghanistan, and oh gosh, yeah, and, and then seeing how in 2021, all for not essentially, you know, and so it was kind of a little, little depressing there. So. Um, 
Meanwhile, so that's what I, I finished. I'm reading another book now, uh, which is interesting, kind of similar, actually, which is kind of funny. But I'll, I'll talk about that when I finish it. Uh, I've been watching a new se- the new season, season five of SEAL Team, which is sort of related as well, uh, which is a CBS drama about the guys who are what most people know as SEAL Team Six. They don't call themselves that, though. They um, seal, the seals don't call themselves Seal Team Six anymore. They, they have a, another name. Okay. But, but it's a very good series. In season five, CBS has moved it to their Paramount Plus streaming platform, so it's no longer on broadcast TV. They've done that with a number of their series, and it's very interesting because there's a there's a definite tonal shift. For one thing, there's more f bombs, <laughs> and uh-huh. and more salty language of what you would expect from you know hard boiled soldiers uh, out there you know so uh it's very very interesting there's not there's not more like um graphic violence uh-huh which it, which i think is interesting uh, but they they they've kind of s- turned up the dial a bit on the language to kind of show this is we're not on broadcast tv anymore but still pretty good but david Boreanaz is really good and it's i really like him it, it there's a little bit of the interpersonal drama a bit not really enough to be a soap opera and there's plenty of the warrior stuff to satisfy the that it's it's still about guys fighting the war on terror you know that sort of uh, right. element so I'm, I'm still enjoying it still a good series the last thing i want to talk about is um apple tv plus movie that just came out called finch starring tom hanks and it's a post-apocalyptic story about this engineer who has survived. Uh, there was a, a solar mass ejection or you know, corona mass ejection or uh-huh. solar flare or something that basically turned up the heat on the whole planet. The science of the, of the disaster is a little shaky. Okay. And I don't want to spoil it, but there's like, in, in the end... It's real. It's really shaky. Like that doesn't seem all that plausible. But okay, but but it, that's fine. It's almost like science fairy tale. Okay. Because there's also the other part of this is he's alone except for he's got a dog. But he's also this talented engineer, and he's built these robots. And in fact, there's this one robot that he calls or calls itself takes its own name, Jeff. And it's really it's sentient. It is it's Pinocchio. This is essentially. Okay. A Pinocchio story, and it's really good. And like he he's created the robot to to help, but mainly to take care of the dog when he's gone. And you get the sense very it's very early. It doesn't really spoil anything to say that the solar radiation is probably killing him. But it won't kill the dog first. No, like he because the dog has he's kept the dog out of the. Underground, they've been living okay. underground. He goes out to get stuff, but he doesn't supply with him, right? And maybe he and well, you're not quite sure. Did he did he get exposed to the radiation when he was at the, at the beginning of this event? You know, you don't know. Okay. So regard and again, like I said, it's a it's science fairy tale, and uh, it's really good. I mean, Tom Hanks is always good, and there's only really three characters in it. There's like. There's, yeah, there's only three characters. There's the Tom, Tom Hanks's Finch character. There's the robot character Jeff and the dog, and that's it. A man. So, so it's basically like what was the one where he was um, Castaway? Castaway. So it's like Castaway except with a robot. Yes, and a dog instead of a, a volleyball. <laughs> with 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 a hey, and at least it can actually talk to him, right? Exactly. That not just in his head. Um, yeah, it's it's. It's really good. Um, the I'm trying to think of what I can say without giving too much away. It's it's a it's not a there's action sequences in it, but it's not an action movie. It's a more cerebral or more relational. Like a big part of it is the of the a thematic is the song American Pie. It plays a few times throughout it, and. The Father, Son, the Holy Ghost that went to the coast is kind of thematic. It's also a road movie. They, they're they they're traveling from where they start, which is St. Louis. They're heading to San Francisco. 
because they think that would be better than where they are. And so it's a, so it's a bit of a road movie. They're in a converted RV meant to protect them and that sort of thing. So it, it's good. I would say, I would recommend it. Just put it okay. that way. And if you have Apple TV Plus, it's included. So you can like get to pay for it. So those are the three things I want to talk about. Now you may unleash your tablecade of books. <laughs> I am not going to detail every book that I've read. We are grateful. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to talk about my, my top three picks. Um, so first was The Three-Body Problem Okay. Uh, by a Chinese author. Uh, Go ahead, mangle it. <laughs> uh, si Xin Lu. Sure. She probably completely mangled that. Xi Jin Lu. Xi Jin, probably something like that. Yeah. Um, so it was originally written in Chinese. The, the author is from China. And it was translated into English. The story starts with the Cultural Revolution in the 60s. And with the one of the protagonists watching her father be killed, who was a university professor, be killed. Um, and that moment, which is kind of deep background for the rest of the story, which takes place mostly in the 80s and then in sort of closer to present day. Um, but that that is pivotal moment in her character, which leads to a huge conflict in the in the story, which was fascinating to me, like watching this this play out. Um, but essentially. It's a hard science fiction novel. There, there are it's super award winning. Like it's one of the oh yeah, mo- like it's uh-huh. won huge number of awards. Yeah, and I, I, I feel like I don't want to give too much away, but um, there are there is so it's sort of a first contact story, except you don't actually meet the aliens in person, um, and. There's like an interactive computer game and there's all sorts of different, like the character, it's a very character driven story. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's something about the, so the laws of physics get changed. Yes. There, this, there, without giving too much away, there is a question about whether the laws of physics have, basic laws of physics have changed and scientists are dying and some of them committing suicide, perhaps because of this. Hmm. Um, it was really good. It's the first in a trilogy, and I have not yet sought out the the next two in the trilogy. But just even as a standalone novel, it was really, it was gripping hmm. and uh, fascinating. Um, the, the The use of the virtual reality game was actually really interesting too. It kind of a lot of the story unspools in the context of the game. Oh, interesting. Which is fascinating. Sort of like Ready Player One? Sort of, but completely unlike Ready Player <laughs> One. But but it's, but it's uh, some of the story takes place in the virtual reality. Yes, some of the story takes place in the virtual reality. And it's, it's but it's a, more, it's a matter of the character is trying to figure out what's going on. And you, the reader, are also trying to figure out what's going on. Okay. Um, so there, it's part of the mystery. Okay. Um, so that was really excellent. Highly recommend. Um, then I also read uh, The Goblin Emperor by Catherine Addison, which is not a recent book, although the sequel came out this summer. So it was sort of my friends were ch- chattering about it, and uh, most people agreed that they didn't like the sequel as much as the original. But the, the original novel, The Goblin Emperor, is high fantasy. It takes place completely in a fantasy alternate world uh, where... All of the characters are either elves or goblins. Okay. Or part elf, part goblin. (laughs) And the protagonist is a young man who has been thrust into the throne of the empire. But he's half goblin, half elf. Um, His, he was not expected to, to, he was not even in the running for contender. He had, three older brothers and his father and they all died in a horrible accident and now suddenly he is emperor with no training no preparation no expectation that he would ever sit on the throne he's basically been lived his entire life in exile and it's a novel that's driven by 
the essential problem of him trying to figure out how to be emperor without being controlled or manipulated by the various people who want to control and manipulate him. So trying to maintain his autonomy Mm -hmm. and to be not a puppet Mm -hmm. emperor. Uh, Well, he doesn't know anybody. He knows no one at court at all. So he's kind of blank slate dropped into the middle of it, trying to figure out what the basic rules are, how the government works, how society works, everything. But he's a really good guy. And he breaks a lot of the rules because he's decent. He doesn't play the games. And so it's kind of watching this good guy and sort of cheering him on while all around him, the people are manipulating, backstabbing, trying to control, um, playing hardball politics. Um, But it's really very character driven. And there was almost no action. I mean, the action is all political intrigue interpersonal relationships not so much like he doesn't really go anywhere he spends the entire novel in the palace okay uh, but it was really gripping and i just i loved it i did read the sequel which is very different it takes one of the minor characters from the first novel and it's a mystery novel like a murder he, he's a detective who's solving mysteries but it's in the same universe i can see why people who loved the Goblin Emperor weren't huge fans. And in a way, it was a little bit disappointing. Like, I wanted more of the Emperor character. And yet, on its own, it was a good book. Uh, So that was called uh, Witness for the Dead. The world that she's built is really interesting. Uh, There's magic, but not a lot of it. Um, There's also tech... they're, They're sort of in a... Um... They have trains and airships, so it's sort of almost a steampunk kind of atmosphere, mm-hmm. uh, and but but with elves and goblins. Okay, and uh, so that's the Goblin Emperor. The Goblin Emperor, and then the other novel that I read that I really liked was the Goblin and the Jenny by Helene Wall. The Gollum. The Gollum. Sorry, the Gollum and the Jenny. G O L E M. And Ginny, D G I N N I. J I N N I. Oh, just J. Yeah. Um, which is probably supposed to be pronounced Genie because the I, I think, is. It's really what, when we say Genie, that's what we're right. talking about. Um, but it's spelled with, with a J I. Yeah, it's the older spelling. Yeah. So the Gollum and the Ginny. Gollum. Gollum. Oh my gosh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher this every single time, aren't I? <laughs> it's an immigrant story. It's New York, 19th century. Late 19th century. Late ni- or mid, mid to late? Or early 20th century. Turn of the century. Turn of the century, really. Yeah. It's turn of the century New York. And it's essentially, the, the author is Jewish and her husband is Arab American. And she started wanting to write about sort of historical novel about their family's experiences as immigrants in this country. But it wasn't working because... That's really not her genre. She's a huge science fiction fantasy geek. And one of her friends finally said, why are you trying to write this kind of book? This is not what you like reading. So what she did was then she turned her two protagonists into supernatural creatures. Pulling from the mythology of Judaism, Eastern European Judaism, and uh, Arab mythology. So genies are Arabic mythology. Golems are from Eastern European Jewish mythology. And so this was fascinating. So the a golem is a constructed creature made out of mud, but but animated by magical words that are put into its mouth traditionally. And so what you have is a a golem who ends up. But they look human. But they look human. Yeah. Now in the in this in the context of this novel, she looks so human that people can't tell that she's not human. Like they mistake her for a person right. unless she acts like with super strength or in a way that's not characteristic of a human being. Right. So she's a, they're both the genie and the golem are supernatural creatures who are able to pass as human. And they're exploring, they're, they're both fish out of water in a double sense because they're immigrants to New York from, um, she's from Eastern Europe. He's from uh, Syria. Yeah. Syria. Yes. And 
really they're, they're both embedded in those communities in New York, in the Lower East Side. And they they find each other. And even though they really shouldn't have much of an affinity, they do just because they're supernatural creatures. And so neither one of them should have the capacity for empathy and understanding and emotions. And yet they kind of seem to grow into these roles. It was a really fascinating book. And I think it worked really well because it had the the fantasy elements, but it also had the, it's a classic immigrant story. Hmm. And the fact that the two of them kind of interwove so beautiful, it was a really a different kind of experience than I read. I, haven't, I suppose you could say it's a sort of urban fantasy, but it's historical novel urban fantasy, right. not contemporary urban fantasy. So it had all that gritty urban quality. And there wasn't anything supernatural in the world except for these two characters. Everything else is just... Regular normal world. Regular normal It's not world. like Hogwarts where the, the magical world is just underneath. Right. So you just have these two magical beings in a mundane world trying to mm -hmm. find their way. Or like um, Harry Dresden where there's a... Yeah. It's not like that. Right. Um like forward to reading them, but uh are there any standalone novels anymore? Because it feels like nearly everything I read is part of a series these days. Any it, fiction. It does seem like that. Well, I think from the point of view of the author, it's kind of almost safest to write. Well the publisher do. Publishers right. want to build an audience. I mean, this is the whole MCUification of entertainment. I mean, an interesting like like Witness for the Dead could have been a standalone mystery novel but, but she tied it into the world of the goblin emperor mm -hmm. in part because people who read the goblin emperor will read witness for the dead right well and the proven yeah proven audiences nobody wants to take a risk on a standalone we want to have either authors who already have a following or stories that we can i you know ips intellectual property that we can expand and I think, though, as a reader, too, I often like to slip into a world where I kind of know the rules and I feel comfortable. There's something nice, and, and there's something nice about exploring a world mm -hmm. more deeply. Also, like, you can get into a story without having to have all of that, where am I, what is going on, sort of introductory stuff. I know what's going on. I know the people. Right. There's the, the, you don't have to do as much explication and background information in a sequel as you did in the original. Right. And oftentimes, if I've enjoyed a book, I'm like, more of the same, please. Yes, thank you. I mean, I, yeah, it's... In some ways, it, it lacks originality. It kind of suppresses the the new for the sake of the... the I mean, we, we're, sequel, we're a sequel nation. Now. Everything is sequelized. And that can be good and bad. I mean, there's plenty of movies that are sequels that that have crowded out anything original, but there's all there's there's so many channels now for stuff to be distributed. Why not? And people can publish on their own. You know, self publish books. So anyway. Uh and you're also reading as bedtime reading more from uh, Terry Pratchett. Terry Pratchett. Tiffany Aching. Yeah. yeah the, the kids love it. We're reading Hatful of Sky, which is the second Tiffany Aching book. And the Feagles are just the funniest thing ever. They are the funniest. Yeah. Just so good. Um, yeah, the series gets darker, so I'm not sure if we're going to read past this one, but it's fun. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that's what we've been reading and watching. And let's talk about, and uh, of course, I've also been watching the new season of Doctor Who, the new uh, Star Trek series Prodigy and Lower Decks. But for that stuff, you'll want to listen to The Secrets of Doctor Who and The Secrets of Star Trek. Right. <laughs> where we talk about those things at length. So I'm not going to take up time talking about it here. Um, so let's talk about uh, Mass and going to, uh, going to church. I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago. We we went to St. Bonaventure Church, which is the closest church to where we are here, a few, uh, few couple times, um, several weeks ago. And that was nice. But we knew that our old pastor, former pastor from our home parish, is a pastor here in three parishes in Plymouth. Plymouth is such a big town. It's got four, maybe five, four churches. Well, actually, no, one of his parishes is in Carver, the next town over. But it's got at least three parishes. It's a big town. Yeah. He's pastor of two of the parishes in town, along with a parish that's in the next town over. And 
we wanted to see him, you know, say hi. We had we hadn't seen him since he left four or so years ago. Yeah, that's a while. It's been a while. So we finally co- uh, coordinated with his schedule so that he wasn't in Carver, uh, and when we weren't sick, and we got over to Saint Cattery Tekakwitha Parish here and uh, on Sunday, and he was there celebrating mass, and it was so nice to see him. He was surprised to see us. And we got to catch up with him a little bit after Mass. It was really nice. Yeah, there's something really wonderful about, you know... Connecting. Reconnecting. Seeing a friend. Yep. Um, and making connections with your your priest, with your pastor. Right. I mean, Father Ray has been so, so great with our family. Um, mm-hmm. He did Anthony's first communion. And Ben's. And Ben's, too? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and Ben's first communion. <laughs> And um, was just confessions and yeah when yeah he just was really a blessing when he was. In you always parish. worry a little bit in the back of your mind. Well, what if what if they don't recognize me? Like yeah, what if they don't remember us? Yeah, we're the, we're the Catholic <laughs> family with five kids. The the white Catholic family in the majority Haitian for Kiperdian parish. <laughs> we kind of stand out a little bit, but yeah, but yeah, so. But he d- he does you know remember us and yeah. c- commented on how big all the kids have gotten mm-hmm. and um, and the deacon happened to be uh, the guy I used to work with at the archdiocese, Deacon Jim, who was the head of healthcare ministry, which I don't know if he still is, but he was when I was there, so that was kind of nice to see him too. But his but Father Rake's homily was perfect for us. It was really good. So it was the if you remember it was the uh, Elijah and the widow and the 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 uh, never ending flower and oil uh, in, during the you know he and it was all about his homily was all about trusting in God Elijah had to trust in God who told him in the midst of a famine leave this place go way over there to a foreign land a foreign land and you'll find a widow and back then as Father said widows were the poorest people in society no one took care of widows like widows you know did, there was no social safety net. Uh, go rely on a widow for your for your food to get by to survive, and so he went. And then he told her, "I know you're about to make your last meal of the small little flour and all you have left, but make that and give it to me, and then God will provide." <laughs> and I mean, what trust did she which which she have had to have had? So, I mean, it, you know, although in the grand scheme of things, this meal, the next meal. We're, you know, from her in her mind, we're gonna die. So if we if we don't get this meal, we're just gonna die sooner. If you know, if if God doesn't come through with this. But nevertheless, uh, Father's homily was basically like about trusting in God that even when bad things are happening, that it's not that bad things don't happen to you, because they do. Because they do to everyone, eventually, you know, all the time. But just trusting in God that he will bless you, that, you know, that it, it is all for the, for, the, uh, for the grand, in the grand scheme of things, for the good. That in the end, that there is a heavenly justice, reward, I mean, however you want to put it, a blessing. Um, I don't know, what would you think? What what did you take away from it? Um, it, it's pretty much says, says yeah, yeah. It was it. It just felt it hit home for me there. Just like the, just it felt like God was saying, you know, trust in me. The that you are like recognizing the blessings we're receiving. The we have a a beautiful home we're staying in. That it's being taken care of by insurance. That we're by the beach. I can continue to work. Um, we're we're fed, we're clothed, you know, the house is getting fixed, things are getting done. And even with all the, the whatever bad things have happened or are happening, there are good things too. And right. So it, it it gave me trust. There's plenty of things that you know are that I'm regretting that we're not that it is not getting done. Like the kids with scouts, I didn't mention that at all. The kids are kids regret that they can't be they're not involved in scouts. They're kind of falling behind their peers, and I'm not able to you know be a, a, an effective den leader. 
you know, that sort of stuff makes me, gives me regrets. I'm sad about that. Um, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, God's got our, God's got us, you know, we're, right. we're going to be fine. I think that's enough. That was, that's, I knew it was going to be a long episode, so we should probably wrap things up. Before we do, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create Raising the Bets. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Raising the Bets and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. We would love to hear your feedback. You can let, uh, let us know whatever you're thinking or any of your reactions at sqpn.com slash bets. That's B as in boy, E-T-T-S. Or the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash starquestmedia. Or send an email to bets at sqpn.com. I'll put links from our discussion, especially to all those books, in our show notes uh, at sqpn.com. Until next time, I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Molly Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Raising the Bets on Starquest.